Welcome to Building Healthy Relationships, the Four Habits podcast, helping you enjoy better harmony at home, thrive at work, and win at life. Here are your hosts, Dr. Andrea and John Taylor Cummings, recognized authorities on the subjects of improving work relationships and cultures, as well as couple and home relationships. Well, hello and welcome to the next in our podcast series. Uh, Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Delighted to have you join us. And we're really looking forward to our conversation today with Stephen Baker, OBE. Stephen has been uh, right in the world of education, transforming, uh, bringing in more innovative and more compassionate approaches. And you know, that's the heartbeat of what we do in relationships. So we're really looking forward to delving into that some more. Uh, So welcome, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And we need to give you your proper introduction, OBE and all. So <laughs> John's going to give Absolutely. us the, the, the background to, to uh, Stephen's bio. Let me do that and see if I can do it justice here. Okay, so Stephen Baker, OBE, is the CEO of the People's Learning Trust, an organization dedicated to transforming education through innovative and compassionate approaches, as Andrew mentioned earlier, aiming to improve the outcomes for students and communities. He has led four schools to outstanding judgments and to um, our audience around the world. Basically, it's the highest level you can get in terms of an accreditation for a school, so top marks there. And that's with the UK Department for Education, citing them as an example of best practice in mental health due to their focus on supporting student and staff well-being. And that's such a big deal right now, and that's another thing we want to delve into some more. Absolutely. Stephen is co-author of the critically acclaimed book about this approach, A School Without Sanctions. He's also a former Ofsted inspector, and in 2019, he was made a founding fellow of the Chartered College of Teaching for his significant and sustained impact on teaching. Stephen previously worked with the Ministry of Justice in youth and adult establishments nationwide with a focus on developing a culture of rehabilitation. Uh, He helped develop the Cradle to Career Project to improve community outcomes. Today, he sits on multiple advisory boards, including the Center for Educational Leadership at the Liverpool John Moores University and the Mental Health Stakeholder Forum for the Crown Prosecution Service. A former United Nations war crimes investigator, Stephen received the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service as a member of the Remembering Srebrenica uh, Northwest Board and was awarded an OBE in the 2020 Queen's Birthday Honours List in recognition of his services to education and tackling hatred. There is just so much in there that we would love to find out a bit more about, to unpack. Stephen, why don't you, you tell us what, what is driving the passion? Where, where, where has this passion come from? What does the journey look like? Um, the journey probably goes back following my original undergraduate degree. Um, I, I was fascinated by traveling, learning about different cultures, meeting new people. And so I spent a lot of my time traveling around the world. I I lived in the wilderness areas of Russia. I taught myself Russian at one point just to go over there for a couple oh. of months. I've lived upstate oh, yes. New York. <laughs> yeah, as yeah. you do. It, yeah, as you do. I, I, I have a, um, a low attention threshold, so I, I get involved in different things. And I decided to teach myself Russian, but I didn't think it through. So I taught myself on my commute to work. So I could speak Russian and I could understand Russian. But when I was in the Moscow underground, I couldn't read a single thing. So I got <laughs> lost frequently. So it sounds better than it actually was. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I ended up down in Australia. I was working on a squid boat down there and I was um, a lifeguard. And I decided to um, become a forensic anthropologist. So I studied forensic anthropology. Ended up, as you've said in the bio, and being asked by the United Nations to go and investigate the Bosnian genocide. And when I was over there, Mm -hmm. I saw some horrendous things and I've Mm -hmm. had to do some horrendous things, collecting evidence to indict war criminals. And that Mm -hmm. really drove my approach to go into education. So I think, you know, I I could speak for the next 45 minutes just about the journey, but I think the big driver really was seeing man's inhumanity to man and wanting to make a difference. That's amazing. And, you know, to go for education, to try and grab young minds uh, that might be varying off and bring them back on course is absolutely the, the thing that we need now when you look at the news and what's going on. Um, oh, yeah. How 
how how do we how do you grab hold of this how do you help turn a school around for example where the only thing they might have known is using sanctions but you want to introduce these more innovative and compassionate approaches how do you bring that alive in in real ways yeah so i'm really fortunate in having a science background and i i was very lucky when i entered education i i rose through the ranks relatively quickly and became a head teacher and then i could start to develop cultures how i wanted them to be developed yeah. in the schools mm. and organizations that i work with um and what i did is that i got heavily involved with a good friend of mine professor alice jones who's um she's a professor of neuroscience and psychology at goldsmiths Mm -hmm. And we looked at where, when you're working with children, and young people who have suffered, you know, adverse childhood experiences and trauma in their lives, and they're in specialist schools for young people with behaviour issues. We realised that if you do what you've always done, you get what you've always got, and the system wasn't Indeed. working. Absolutely. It wasn't. It wasn't right for these young people. Uh, perhaps punishment works for the majority of people. You know, if my wife says to me, "Do that again," you're sleeping on the couch. I don't do it again. <laughs> However. If if you look at the significant minority now um, globally, punishment simply doesn't work and mm -hmm. punitive measures don't work and, and putting young people and children into isolation and whatnot, that's probably one of the most socially devastating things that you can do mm -hmm. to people. So mm -hmm. we decided to go the other way and look at what might work. So we decided to remove punitive measures from the schools and obviously using that approach, it, everyone was very very concerned that mm -hmm. i think they basically thought it's going to end up like the wild west you have some of the most yeah. challenging yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. potentially aggressive and violent young people and then you remove punishment but actually it went the other way and some of the results we've achieved as as a set of schools that i've worked with have been nothing short of phenomenal our latest set of results at my current school um are probably comparable to mainstream schools where which are just really? filled with neurotypical young people they've been absolutely phenomenal and wow. what is that oh gosh there's so many questions i want to ask as a parent i, I want to <laughs> sneak in with one there though i mean that's a great yeah. outcome to get but at, at any point were you just thinking oh my goodness this this could go wrong here this may not work oh. we may end up with, with a, a load of deviance on our hands <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's always self doubt. I think I think it's right to have that self doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest challenges that I had years ago was asked to go into a primary school for children with social, emotional, and mental health difficulties, and so we had you know six to eleven year olds who could be very violent and aggressive, mm -hmm. and and they were self harming and threatening each other. And there was a big chain in terms of the staff and the leadership team and the governing body were removed. And there was a police investigation into the school. And someone came along and said, will you go in? Otherwise, we're going to have to close the school. And that could potentially be a career ender if you get it wrong. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, ultimately, why are we doing it? I I think because of what I've been through, I've got a lot of meaning and purpose in my life. And I want to make the world a better place. Yeah. And so I said, yes. I said, but. I said yes with a caveat that I, we do it our way and we do it mm -hmm. using these compassionate approaches and we focus on relational approaches and restorative practice and reduce that those challenging behavior not by managing behavior so i'm a big scaredy guy from liverpool i could go and scream and shelter children but mm -hmm. what i wanted to do is help them change their behaviors habitually over the long term by rewarding what we wanted to see yeah. engaging with them more effectively having those relationships and building trust and within 18 months of us being there that school went from closure to outstanding oh my word so so can you give us an example steve That's meaning where I was going. you know you have a child who for whatever reason background broken home pain in their in their history turns up with this violent approach or self harming and you're no longer punishing them what do you do with this child in front of you? Like, what do you do first? What do you do next? What's the journey that you aim to take them on? So before any any of the children or young people join our school, we meet them. So we have a really, um, really detailed transition period where we, we get to meet them. We get to understand what makes them tick. We find out everything about them, about their lives, about their previous education careers, if you will, in different schools. 
can we get is to this know from them? the because child or from do you find this in conversation with the child or everybody else as well absolutely everybody from the child themselves because okay. pupil and student voices is, is absolutely critical we need to know what they're what they're understanding is from parents from carers from families from grandparents from schools mm -hmm. anyone right. and everyone we want to know more about them and then once we've done that we can start to build a relationship with them and that relationship's absolutely vital because we need to get trust and once we've gained their mm -hmm. trust and we start to understand them will build their self-confidence if we build their self-confidence we build their engagement if we build their engagement and get them to care we start to improve what we call botheredness we get them to be actually bothered about what's going on around them so this approach and developing the relationships is is certainly time consuming it's not an overnight yeah, fix it yeah. doesn't happen straight away but what it allows us to do is it allows us to move our thinking upstream so we're not reacting to the behavior we see in front of us we're starting to be more proactive mm -hmm. about our whole approach i think what Alice talks about in some of her research, and she's done meta-analyses of, of how to improve behavior culturally across institutions, mm -hmm. is, is she's, she works with us so we don't just focus on tackling the antisocial behavior. We actually promote and demonstrate pro-social behavior because a lot of children and young people simply mm. don't know how to behave appropriately. So that's Indeed, absolutely critical. Modeling those behaviors and, and modeling them between staff as well and developing relationships with staff. And those relationships come from clear and effective communication. So we start off with communication. Yeah, I'm not surprised that you mentioned that Alice is applying this uh, into corporates because the themes and the language that you're using, we could be talking about inclusion and how do you change toxic cultures in an organization to become more relational more compassionate but with more empathy um and this idea of not just being anti the bad behavior but being very clear of the behavior that you want and rewarding the good behavior is a challenge um how do you manage uh, how do you uh, in a sense ignore <laughs> the the behavior that you don't want and mm. reward the one that you do want it's a real challenge it's a real challenge and yeah. what you've got to do there are some behaviors that we simply cannot ignore so we cannot right. ignore if someone assaults a member of staff we cannot ignore if someone's bringing illegal drugs into the school so we have to act but what we're also mindful of is as we're acting if someone is in a heightened state we need to de-escalate that state before we can start to tackle the behaviors yeah you know yeah. If, if the flight or flight the fight or flight i beg your pardon response kicks in adrenaline has a half-life of about 45 minutes but we're not only dealing with the incident itself and a heightened state from that we're also dealing with the potential threat so if we look at adverse childhood experiences and children young people have experienced trauma they're feeling threat all the time they have this heightened state of anxiety pretty much all the time they're on a hair trigger and it's not just a real threat it could be a perceived threat or the memory of a threat so if a child or young person is heightened and then they are triggered again by remembering something that's happened they're going to stay up there and there's no point trying to deal with that behavior or tell them to yeah. look at me Whether or they're... you're going to do this or this is going to happen next because they simply don't care and it's not that they are not caring people they are in such a state of heightened um sensitivity and their behaviors are heightened their their frontal cortex pretty much shuts off and so they yeah. genuinely don't care so we need yeah. to bring that state right back down where possible if it's low level behavior you try and ignore that behavior and then catch someone doing the right thing and reward that behavior mm -hmm. and if you want it to happen I'm, I'm i'm really lucky i've got two young daughters and um they're my guinea pigs i've been practicing on them for for <laughs> years and years now and you know loads of people always say to us we'll be out in public and strangers will come up and say your daughters are so well behaved they're beautifully behaved but it's because they're my guinea pigs and that's why i practice and every time i, I catch them <laughs> doing something right i praise it because the, 
the theory is based on um, some neuroscience work by someone called Donald Hebb back in the 50s and 60s. And it's about repeating that behavior. And it's about making it become ingrained and having a new neural pathway through it by repetition, repetition, repetition. Wow, I I just love this so much in there that so much good stuff in there. What I found particularly ex- uh, interesting, actually, that was talking about this heightened state and talking about the as you said, adrenaline has a half life of forty five minutes. I love that. For me, love that is that. just so practical. Where you then know, okay, they're heightened. No point doing anything just now. Time it. Wait, yeah. <laughs> wait for it to drop off a little bit. Wait another forty five minutes. Down and down again. But that's something practical you can work with there. Um, so so <laughs> powerful. Do you? I was going to say, do you have any any examples where um, yeah. you've seen situations that are, you know, not looking good? Things are going out of control, but there's some you've applied some of these principles and turned it around. Any examples that you're able to share? Absolutely, I think more of an unusual <laughs> example. When I moved into the primary school, we didn't have a great building, but we had a lot of space. So what we introduced was a farm. And it might okay. sound a bit odd. We we ended up with with pigs, with with chickens, with goats, with sheep. And if anyone ever tells you to buy a micro pig, it's a lie. They grow big. So <laughs> we ended up with a micro pig that was the size of a size of a small car. But what we found is if we if we identify that the child was starting to become um, heightened in their behaviours and you're starting to 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 get to a place where we didn't want them to be, we'd ask them to go and work with some of the animals because they were absolutely fascinated by the animals. And it was almost providing them with the opportunity to de-escalate themselves and also mm-hmm. provide mm-hmm. social support to the animals. We'd say something like, oh, you know, um, Elmo the goat isn't feeling well today. Could you just go and go and feed him some carrot or go and feed some grass or whatever we did? Because that social support works both ways. Not only does it de-escalate the child, but it also helps them feel better about themselves because they're doing something good for something else and yeah, it also yeah, yeah. works on a peer-to-peer basis so we'd ask young people who we thought they might you know sometimes we'd get a phone call from home to say that x x y or z is in is in a fairly heightened state they've not had a good night they've not slept something's happened so we'd automatically pick them up and rather than berating them or putting them in isolation or asking them to do something else we'd give them a job to do Mm-hmm. And that helps us build that relationship because people like helping other people. Yeah, yeah. Fundamental wiring is it's just so amazing. And I'm sure there's so many skills that we could apply to conflict between adults. You know, they say conflict in the workplace is is, is so high as it is. And de-escalating um, what's going on in the world now. So many of those skills that you could be applying there. What are some of the principles that you would encourage people to apply in tense situations, in situations of misunderstanding, just, you know, between adults, for example, not necessarily children? I think uh, if you consider some of the four habits that you speak about, I like the ask, Mm -hmm. don't assume. We often Mm -hmm. assume things, don't we? And we go in, we think we know particularly yeah. as as teachers we're the adults so we know better than you but mm-hmm. we shouldn't assume we don't know what shoes the other person is walking in we don't know what they've had going on with them there was an example i remember from maybe 10 years ago and i had a really good relationship with a young person at one of my schools and one day someone came into into my classroom and said listen Get, I'll change his name. So get outside. David's really upset. He he was trying to kick a door off the hinges. He had someone by a um, by a lanyard around the throat, and he was screaming and swearing. And this was not his behaviour at all. And they mm. were trying to react to his behaviour. So I went out and spoke to him and just found out what was going on. Ninety ninety percent of the time, he's the most beautiful beautiful young man. He was brilliantly behaved. You could rely on him to do jobs. We had a great relationship. He'd been evicted with his family that night. So he didn't know where he was going home to. He was doing Mm. well in school. He didn't know if he was going to see his mum again. He didn't know if he was going to see his siblings again. And then if you consider Maslow's hierarchy, you know, some of those fundamental pieces, not just right at the bottom of the hierarchy, but further up in terms of relationships and security, 
he everything was out the window how could yeah. we expect him mm. to engage with his academic work if we couldn't mm -hmm. so i had to speak with him take him away and just give him the opportunity to tell me what was going on yeah wow that takes i keep thinking about it you know <laughs> even as a grown-up it, it takes so much grown-upness yourself yeah. to be able to turn up well to these situations and not get triggered into your own fight or flight response mm. how do you look um, after you <laughs> to, to be able to I turn think, up I well think that's really important um it, it's really important um, i'm actually only 23 i just look like this because i'm so stressed <laughs> all the time um no i, I think emotional intelligence is key so what we do or what we've done in all of my schools and at Everton Free School at the moment in the football college is we focus not just on academic attainment, but the holistic progress of the child mm. as a whole. We look at some of the 21st century skills that you won't get tested on, but are crucial. So resilience, yeah, emotional intelligence, just that have, have a go attitude, getting people out of the comfort zone. And I think it's really important to understand your own emotions in terms of EQ as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what I go out and I do lots of keynotes and I, I talk about this neuroscience and psychology. But one of the key things I say to people is take a breath because it's no good just running into a heightened situation without managing your own emotions first. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been threatened. I've been held up. Not not necessarily in my schools. I, I've been held at gunpoint before. All sorts of bad things have happened. What you need to do is just take a breath, manage your breathing, and just focus on the behavior, not the person. Yeah. Because you can yeah. like the person, but you can hate the behavior. And what yeah. that person needs to know is that they're in unconditional regard for them coming through. Every day is a clean slate. And you need to be able to maintain that relationship by having the unconditional regard and not forgetting that some of that behavior is being driven, particularly in some of the extreme cases, is being driven by either unmet need or previous trauma, particularly with some of the children and young people we work with. That's so powerful. Love that. Focus I mean, on the person, not the behavior. And and the fact that it's coming from an un, unmet need. And also mm. to, um, you said it differently. It's a, a, about the relationship that you want to maintain, not the behavior. Yeah. What was the term you used? Um, I don't know. I'm it, sorry. It come up again I was in the flow. Because <laughs> you said it a couple of times. Um, it'll come back to me. But but just it's so much so much richness in there and being able to take that breath mm. so that you can turn up better and deal with it and not have your own fight or flight. I love where you say managing your own emotions. There's uh, I can't remember the authors, three authors who spoke about the three conversations that happen in our heads. It's what actually happened. How does that make me feel? And how does that challenge my sense yeah. of yeah. self-worth? Uh, you know, yeah. what, what are you thinking about me? Not quite the words they use, but that's what's going on in both our yeah. heads. How do we get better at, at managing it ourselves? How do you support your staff, your team members uh, in the leadership, for example, to get better in their own emotional intelligence, EQ, ability to to deal with these very emotionally intense situations? Um, yeah, so we have a lot of, of support between each other, particularly because you can get vicarious post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. from dealing with, you know, children, young people who have experienced, you know, le high levels of abuse and then they're coming to you and you can, you mm -hmm. can absorb that. So what we do, we have lots of networks where we can speak to each other about it and we can help decompress. We have different systems whereby we can go and speak with mental health workers. So at Everton Free School, we have a multidisciplinary team. So th there can be issues trying to get child and adolescent mental health support services through the NHS at the moment. There can be huge waiting lists. There can be massive mm -hmm. waiting lists to get a psychologist. So we've stopped that because our focus is to go upstream to tackle these mm -hmm. behaviors before they actually manifest. I have my yeah. own educational psychologist who comes into Everton weekly, who's phenomenal. I have mental health support workers. I have speech and language therapists. I have family support workers who can go out and work with the families as well to help them with their understanding of their child's behavior. So we have this multidisciplinary team in place right at the heart of the school. 
Wow. With regard to the, with regard to the staff, uh, um, whenever I try to develop a culture in a school, I, I love using um, some of the work by, I don't know if you've ever come across Cotter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. Cotter's really? in the Harvard Business School. So yep. yeah, just a fantastic, great book about penguins and icebergs melting as well mm-hmm. and, and the need to change a culture. But one of the most important things that I do is I don't micromanage people. So I have a fairly compassionate approach. I don't have a hierarchy with it. There's obviously a hierarchy within the structure, but in terms of yeah. relationships and speaking to each other, I flatten the hierarchy right down. Mm-hmm. I don't micromanage and I have a, an element of psychological safety within the workplace. So I'll give someone a job to do. I delegate and I have devolved leadership so different people can own their own areas of the school and the development. And I support them to get to mm-hmm. where they want to be rather than try and be critical. I just give them the opportunity to have autonomy and they've mm-hmm. already got the meaning in, the, in, in their work anyway and with, with young people who are often challenged. So they have that meaning already. They have autonomy and I'm not micromanaging them. I'm just supporting them to go on the journey. Mm-hmm. So it tends to be really successful. Wonderful. I mean, it sounds like you're, with all the challenges of the behaviours that come in and the transformation that needs to happen, it sounds like that's the environment that people would want to be in anyway in the midst yeah. of all the change going on. So so given all you've achieved, Stephen, what next? Where, where, do, where do you go now? You know, you've, you've done some great work, but what, what what's still on the on the radar for you? There's quite a lot going on uh, on the radar. So I, I moved more recently to Everton Free School. So Everton Football Club, the Premier League club, um, they have their own pupil referral unit or alternative provision school for 120 children and young people with challenging behaviour. But we also have a football college and we have our own degree. Oh, wow. So okay. I've, got a lot go- I've got a lot going on there, but we've just become a multi-academy trust and I've stepped up to be the, the CEO. So we've now got other schools who are joining us, all who share our values. So that's the most important right. thing for me. In terms of due diligence of who joins us is, do you, do you have that inclusive approach? Do you have a relational approach? And do you believe in what we're trying to do? Mm. So in the next couple of years, you know, we'll be a, a fairly large organization with multiple schools, you know, million do- million dollar. Sorry, I've just come back from America. Um, you know, huge million pound <laughs> budgets. Um, yeah. And I'm really fortunate. I do sit on lots of steering groups um, and advisory boards. So I help advise. I've advised the Department for Education, the Ministry of Justice. I do work in, in, in various prisons as well. And something I'm really passionate about is is a place-based change project I developed with um, a local billionaire who gave some funding to a charity and I helped set it up. And I used to sit on the steering group called Cradle to Career where we're changing an entire community. So it's not just academic outcomes. It's right away from cradle to career. And we have faith sector, private sector, um, third sector, public sector organizations all pulling in the same direction. That is just amazing because when you can start seeing it rippling through to impact in the community, that's when you're getting real change in the nation and in the generation that we really need to be supporting. You know, since COVID, for example, mental health, and stress concerns are just continuing to to skyrocket. How would you advise, so with your school and your experience, there's lots that you already have in place and know what to do. For schools that might be starting from scratch based mainly on punitive or sanction uh, type of control, how would you encourage them to invest in a more relational or more compassionate approach in general even if they're not you know predominantly challenged behaviors coming I, i'm in. going to say just before you jump in there with a the response Stephen, i think that is going to be so topical now because mm-hmm. as i understand it the the new labor government have made announcements as they want to withdraw i think this it's um they, they, they well okay in, in a school setting to be fair we haven't had um uh, corporal punishment for a while but i think they they are now saying they want to remove that even in the home make make it completely outlawed so i think the nation uh, of the UK is moving in that direction of saying actually sanctions are not necessarily a good thing. What's going to fill the gap? Yeah, how do how do we do yeah. it? How do we do it? I think a lot of people who, who visit my school they can't quite believe it's true, so they come and visit and they expect no consequences. <laughs> but that's not what we did. There are always going to be logical and natural consequences in life. So consequences are still in place, but we don't use punitive measures. We don't punish. Mm-hmm. We don't shout. 
I've personally never shouted at my daughters, and I don't need to because what we found. <laughs> I think so. I know that's why I look like this. I'm exhausted. <laughs> no, it's um. I think once you've got a relationship in place, and that's the key. Once you've got the relationship, the thing that affects other people most is the social disapprobation. All I need to do is say to my daughters, "You've let me down," and that almost breaks them. You know, they're really upset because they don't want to let me down. And so I think that's a really important thing to do. What I'd say to other schools is to just look out there because I've worked with, I've worked with all sorts of schools. I, I, I was flown over to Jersey to train the head, the primary head teachers right across the island a couple of months ago. I'm over in London working with head teachers. I've been in Cambridge working with head teachers. What I'd say is we can often get caught up with the debate that is very polarized you either punish or you mm-hmm. are a woolly liberal and you reward yeah. all yeah. the bad exactly. kids and i think actually there are shades and shades of gray in life what we need to do is we need to come in the middle and we need to not get caught up in an echo chamber where we might follow certain people on x or twitter or we might do certain things or read certain newspapers we need to just absorb all the research that and all the best practice that is about us and then choose what we're going to do in our schools because there's been a lot of work by the eef the education and down foundation Mm -hmm. on behavior and changing behavioral cultures in schools and there are a few different headlines of what you should do but underpinning everything is consistency whatever you do stick to it and do it well and obviously i'd argue that in a mainstream a large mainstream secondary school for example punishment will work for the children so i'm not saying remove detention when i work in prisons i don't say to them don't punish prisoners are in there to be punished the isolation from society Mm. is the punishment what i'm saying is particularly with the with the ministry of justice is you need to now focus on reducing re-offending rates we need to focus on that to help thin out the prison population which is Mm. skyrocketed as we know yeah yeah and it comes back to what you were saying earlier about being very clear on the pro-social behaviors that you want to uh, absolutely and model. I just I just love that word pro-social. I think most many people not even aware of it. Anti-social has sort of almost become a word, and not thinking of it as being anti-social. Yes, yeah. anti-social. Then clearly there's pro-social. Why don't we yeah. focus on that? It's just it's just uh, absolutely. Yeah. What, so don't what should just be done? not be antisocial. Correct. Be intentional about yeah. being very social and yeah. very. Um, absolutely yeah. and, and model that behavior in front of particularly young children and it doesn't yeah. even have to be primary age children you know some 11 to 16 year olds let's let's be honest post pandemic you know that we need to press a big reset button because a lot yeah. of those social structures went away for a couple of years in the pandemic right. and what we need to do is start to demonstrate them model them and and reward them the repetition of reward means the behavior will repeat it. And if you repeat it enough times, it becomes a habit. Absolutely. Well, we're talking about that with leaders. So it's not just the young people yeah. who need it. It's modeling, you know, how do you deal with anger? You're mm-hmm. managing your own anger and frustration. What gets modeled in the organization creates toxic behaviors a lot of times. Yeah. How do you model a different way and show leaders how to lead well? when keeping it psychologically safe so it's the same conversation just with a different audience uh absolutely very very powerful i'm i'm conscious of time Stephen. there's so many other questions we could ask you but is there anything we've not touched on that you would like to that you wanted to share or highlight or a principle you wanted to leave everybody with to consider it's just something that i always think about um is is work around epigenetics now because mm-hmm. we deal with a lot of children young people who are from good backgrounds you know mm-hmm. middle class backgrounds who've got loving families and relationships but the latest research in epigenetics shows that trauma can be inherited oh. so there's a really interesting paper in 2014 about inherited trauma and um, using some research with mice i think it was in nature and it just shows that we don't know what we don't know we need mm-hmm. to build up relationships to try and understand what's driving that behavior so i think that's probably the only other thing that i'd mention I, I could talk with you both for hours it's been a really nice conversation thank you so much 
Well, that's our that, pleasure. That really I, I think there's a round two that will be coming up later on because uh, so much of what you're doing, well, it's it's in, incredibly valuable at the young age, getting the young minds yeah. and shaping them in pro-social ways, especially now with what we're seeing on the news with young children committing murders. You know, Lord help us if that's a direction yeah. that we're going in as a generation. So a lot of work to do there, but it just so naturally dovetails with work in the corporate space with yeah. adults, especially around yeah. the topics of toxic behavior, psychological safety, inclusion, and so on. And and you, you've touched yeah. on some from your personal experience, but a lot of it has been uh, around advice for people in the educational sector, teachers, etc. But for the benefit of any parents listening in on the call here, from your own personal experience, but also from the vast amount of work you've done in the space of working with young people, one word of advice for them, perhaps, and what you want to do with, with the young people around you? Understanding. Mm -hmm. I think if there's going to sum it up, it would be understanding. So communication. I'm not trying to teach people to suck eggs. You know, parents mm -hmm. know their children really well. But just talk to them and find on, find out what's driving their behavior, yeah. how they feel. Help them manage their own emotions while you also simultaneously manage your own emotions. And the, yeah. the other thing that I'd say is... Um, the brain remains plastic throughout life. So we all know early intervention is absolutely key and early identification of need. And it's far more effective than remedial action. But people can change. You can teach an old dog new tricks. So it's never too late, but the, that early intervention is absolutely critical. Amazing. Uh, There's hope for us all, yeah? There is, a, you know, a great <laughs> to end on the, the, the note of hope. And we say the same thing, you know, we're, there's no forum really where yeah. you are intentionally taught how to do relationships well uh learn yeah. it at whatever stage you're at but if we can help shape people with that understanding from early everybody is better off so Stephen, thank you so much for how sharing that wealth of of wisdom and ex and proven track record that it works it's not soft and woolly it delivers real change uh, and bottom line results so thank you. I was going to ask, how, how can people find out more? I know there's the book, uh, A School Without Sanctions, uh, but any, anything else? And, and we can put the links in the show notes, but anything else, any other resources you'd like to share that, that people can find out more about you and the work that you're doing? Um, there's probably too much. Uh, one of my daughters once Googled me and was shocked. So, you know, there's lots of war crime <laughs> stuff on there. So I, I, I might not necessarily recommend that. I'm on LinkedIn. So okay. you can find me on LinkedIn. I think I'm Stephen Baker OBE. Um, yeah. You know, relationships are fundamental. And one one of the people always say, "What's the proudest thing that you've achieved?" And um, there aren't. But Ofsted wrote two things uh, about two of my schools, and one was relationships are the key to success, and the latest was the school builds exceptionally trust in relationships. And wow. I think that's what we need to remember. Relationships are cru crucial. At at the heart of it all, humans are relational beings. We need to be with other people and we need to understand ourselves and other people. What a note. I know. I note to say, end what up. a note to end on, bringing it right back to, to, to the sense of knowing yourself, knowing others and building those trusting relationships. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. We, we say thank, thank you to you. you. Huge, huge, uh, tremendous thanks. And thanks again to our audience for listening in. Yeah. Uh, we do this because of the impact that we believe it's having out there. The feedback we get is great. Uh, people are hearing these tips. They're being inspired. And we know that after today's session, people will leave with some great ideas, some tips. I've certainly come away. Just It's just reinforced some of the things that I've been doing, especially in, in um, interacting with our children who are now all sort of grown young adults now. But just remembering back to some of the times where they've had uh, moments of irrational behavior and not responding to that. And actually, once you probe and as you say, build understanding, you discover actually there was something upstream. Again, I'm using all your language here now, something <laughs> upstream that was impacting them and coming out. So some great uh, practical things we can all be doing to improve our relationships. So thanks again to you. Thanks to our audience and see you all on the next the show. Bye-bye. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did and you want to hear more, the best thing to do is subscribe. Then you'll never miss an episode. There's a new one every Friday. You can stay connected with us on social media at The Four Habits for updates, behind the scenes content, and to participate in discussions related to the show. We always love to hear from you. And of course, if you've enjoyed this podcast, 
please leave us a review on your preferred platform to allow us to reach more listeners and help people around the globe radically transform the way they do relationships so they too can enjoy better harmony at home, thrive at work and win at life.